today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. You guys ready for this? No, you're not. I promise. (laughs) And do this, Paul says, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of our sinful nature. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. All right. How's that for a reading today? We skipped right past like submitting to authorities and so forth, and we're going straight into it. Because today we begin the season of Advent. You see, we have lit the first candle in our Advent wreath. And the season of Advent is a time of expectation, of looking forward. And we do that generally in church by looking backwards. By seeing who God is and what he's done, looking at his works throughout history so that we can understand our God more clearly, so that when the time comes for his appearing, when he shows up in the way that we can't deny, we'll understand that it's him who's here among us. Because we believe that God is alive and that he is here, he is for us and he's with us. But oftentimes it's really difficult to understand and to discern how that works. I think the biggest problem is that we often imagine exactly, uh, that we know exactly what it is that God is doing. And this is the biggest impediment to understanding what he's really up to. You see, we all have expectations about what God is like, what God wants, and what God is going to do in the future. And the clearer we think we have those things understood, well the harder it's going to be to see him if he does something different than we expect. This is true throughout the history of the church. It's true, uh, true throughout the history of the world, as a matter of fact. Jesus came, and he had disciples there with him who would ask him quite often about what are going to be the signs of the coming uh, kingdom of God, what are going to be the signs of God's Messiah showing up. But they're asking the guy, and he's there right in front of them, and they misunderstand And so they miss God's work and God's will. And it's only later that things are corrected. God gives us that opportunity as his people. Now he does that for us as well by giving us a cause to revise our expectations about the work and the will of God. How does he do it? He does it in a couple of ways. First, he shows us what he's truly like. And it's only then, once we can see him more clearly, we can understand the kinds of things that he does. Now, I'll tell you what, in the church today, we have this problem on display all around us. There are people who believe all kinds of different things, and I'm not here to uh, cast aspersion on, on anyone's particular ways of thinking about God or about what his work and his will is going to be, but I do think it's important that when we... Uh, try to understand God clearly that we go to a place where we can find him reliably. For us, that's the word of God. It's his scripture. We believe that all of this is, is inspired by God. That is to say, God breathed and it's useful for us so that we can understand, we can correct ourselves and our expectations. And the problem with that, of course, is that every time we have to revise our expectations, those things that we imagine we knew and understood very clearly, Everything has to change along with it. And the revising of our expectations often comes with a sense of disappointment. I'll tell you what, over the course of this last year, I've had a number of times where I've had to revise my expectations, and with that came disappointment. Now, I could share, I suppose, a number of stories, but some of them, I think, illustrate things more clearly than others. Over the course of this last year, I've had the opportunity to reach out to an appliance repair person. That guy is an expert. Turns out it's not at uh, uh, repairing appliances, though. 
but he can revise your expectations like few other people. You think you know what 8 a.m. is? No, you don't. Apparently, only he knows. Now, I've also been known to revise some expectations in my day. My wife, uh, has, we have literally had a sit-down conversation about what two minutes and five minutes actually is. And when my wife says, Hun, can you help me with this? I'll be there in two minutes. She mistakenly imagined that she understood that as 120 seconds, that she knew exactly what two minutes were. But we had to have a conversation. And she had to be let down just a little bit. And her expectations updated. I mean, the proverbial couple of minutes. I mean, a period of time that is not descript, but it's, it feels short to me. Because I'm not waiting. But it's when we are aligned with, uh, with the true nature of things, not just our expectations about them, no matter how reasonable our expectations seem to us to be, that everything becomes a little bit clearer. And we're able to see things more for what they are. And then we're able to live more appropriately. Because there's many different ways we could talk about the expectations we have about the coming of Christ. But not all of them will help us to live better. And in the book of Romans today, the Apostle Paul is writing, he's saying to uh, the Roman church, to the Christians of his day, who had improper expectations about what it meant to be God's people, that it's time for them to revise their expectations as well. You see, because they are absolutely God's people, just like you and I are God's people. And we imagine that we know what it's like, I think, uh, when God is here for us and when he's here with us. You know, we hold this as a doctrinal truth, a belief that we all have, that God is for us, he's not against us, that he loves us and he, he's here doing certain things. And chief among them is forgiving our sins making us his people. And he does that by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And all people who have faith that his sacrifice avails against sin, that is to say that if we are forgiven through what he's done for us, that we simply receive it by faith, and as a gift, we're God's people. And you know, we're right about that. There's an expectation, I think, in life that most people have that, well, the way that we get right with God is by doing exactly what he wants all the time and as a matter of fact words like the ones that we've read where it's saying don't do this don't do that don't do the other thing often confirm in our minds or in the minds of many people who first encounter the god's word that all it basically is is a list of rules of how to do good things and that what god wants out of you is to just do good and don't do bad and then everything will be fine but all people who've come to faith true faith that trusts that salvation is the gift of God by faith in Christ's work, not in our work, have had to revise our expectations and revise our understandings because what we found is that even though we were still sinners, Christ died to forgive us. And it isn't by our own righteousness and our own perfect living that we are now God's people, but simply because he gave it to us. And he gave it to us through the work of Jesus and through nothing else. And with those revised expectations, now it's time to start looking at the world a little bit differently. Because if it isn't all just, don't do this, do this. If it all it isn't just prohibition and urging us on to perfection, well then what do words like this mean? Now obviously I'm not going to go into graphic detail following up here. I feel like the Apostle Paul, he did us justice today. Well, let his words stand. But let's simply say that all of these things stand for those desires of our humanity to experience joy or pleasure, to seek after those things that sound best to us in a moment rather than that those things that are best for us in the long run. But those things are still something that the people of God are engaged in. If we're going to understand church right, we're going to need to revise our expectations. Because a lot of people outside of the church especially, and maybe a lot of people inside of it as well, imagine that what you're going to find in a place like this is a bunch of people who are at least on their best behavior at all times, doing what's right to the best of their ability. But if you have the church, the early church, which we so often look up to, 
And I think if we open our Bibles and read about that, we'll have to revise our expectations. What we find is that, sinner, that God was still, back then, saving sinners. That they were involved in all of the worst kinds of things. But they were still God's people. That it wasn't about the perfection that they brought to the table, or even, it seems, their best efforts to deny themselves those things which were wrong, but that they wanted, that made them God's people. Back then, it was still just Jesus. It was still not perfect abstention from all sin, but being forgiven for all of our sins. That's a very different view of the church. It makes being involved in a place like this very different as well, because it means that the person next to you, you can look at them if you want. Don't make eye contact for too long. It can get uncomfortable. They're a sinner. They still sin. They still fall short of the glory of God. And God is still forgiving them. And if that's the case, if that's what God is truly about and what he's doing, and that's what he's been doing from the very beginning and what he's going to be doing right up until the very end, then we need to revise our expectations, I guess, about what this life lived together is going to be like. That it's going to need to be built on the same things that God has built his relationship to sinners on, which is forgiveness and mercy and grace and an understanding that people often do chase after things that are not ultimately good for them, but may seem good to them in the moment. This is true of not just sinners as such, but real people, the people you're sitting with, the people you are, the true of our kids. That's a really hard thing to accept because we don't want what's bad for them. Sometimes they do. We're going to have to revise our expectations of the future because it's not going to be perfect no matter how perfectly we try to live. And ultimately, we're going to have to revise our expectations about what to do with the commands of God. Because if they're no longer for us, in light of Christ's sacrifice, the way that we get to heaven, then what are they for? And I think this is one of the ways that we need to revise our expectations and understand the work and the will of God. What is it like when God is present for us? If during the season of Advent, and generally we want to imagine what it's like when God is here, when he's working, when he's doing his thing. We all imagine that our lives are going to be better for the sake of that, and I think you're right. But what, is it, what does it look like day to day? Well, where God is present, there the, the works of God and the will of God is being done. <clears throat> and the Apostle Paul writes to these people who are still engaged in, in sin that, frankly, is so shameful, it kind of feels weird to read in front of people at church as a pastor. And it probably feels just as weird to have read to you by a pastor in church. But for those people, for people like us, for God's people, and for sinners, we have to remember that those words still have meaning for us. Because when God is present, everything is different. Everything is different. And the biggest problems in our lives as individual Christian people is the same problem that it is for us all together as God's people. We forget what it looks like when God shows up. When God shows up, everything can be different. The thing that, hold, that holds you fast, those desires of your flesh, whether they're the same as those things that Paul mentioned, or maybe they're a little bit more sedate. But those things that you know you shouldn't keep doing but you can't figure out how to quit. Those thoughts that you have and those doubts that you have, the things that you wrestle with, the ways that you walk away from God and towards something else, for all of those things, there's hope when God is present. And so often in this world, we imagine not only that there are things that we do, but ultimately that we'll become the people who do them that our sins are no longer something that we've done, but our identity now. And to do that is to misunderstand the power of God and the will of God when he's present. Where Jesus is, there's a power over sin that is able to change us, 
maybe not always in the moment like we'd like, miraculously sparing us from any work or difficult decisions or a difficult path in life. But where he is, everything can be different. You can say no to the things that you so often say yes to but shouldn't. You can walk away from those things that ruin your relationship to God and to one another. And you could begin today, you have the power today to begin living a new life in Jesus Christ. And this power is present wherever God is present. And just as in the beginning when Christ first came, so many people were looking for something so different that they missed him, that they couldn't understand the power or the presence of God in their lives. And they lost out. So too can you and I. We don't know what we're looking for. Because where God is present for us, when he shows up, things change. It's time to revise our expectations. It's time to start thinking differently about the world that we live in. It's time to start thinking differently about who we are in that world and who we are to one another what your power is and how strong you are and how strong the things are that have laid hold of you in your life. It's time to start thinking differently. Because if you think there's something so strong that God can't break the chains that bind you to it, then you don't truly understand the work and the power and the will of God in Christ. And just as he came first to a world that expected him to look a certain way and to do certain things, but he showed up as an infant child to give his life not for violence sake and not for justice sake but for the sake of forgiveness and love and mercy and peace the things that we struggle so often to be able to bring into being he shows up today in your life I bet in places where you don't expect that he is often in the face of another person doing a good deed for you he's often on the lips of another person is speaking mercy and grace and forgiveness, those gifts of God that he brought into being in Christ, being given for you when you can finally forgive, when you can finally move on. The power of God is present in that moment. When you can say no to the thing that feels like you can't say no to it, the power of God is present in that moment. And when we revise our understanding and our expectations about life and what things truly are like, only then are we ready to see God. And so for this Advent season, I pray that the first step in your walk uh, with, with God through Christ is to look ahead to what God is doing by looking back to what he's done. Where he's present, everything is going to be different, but he's not going to be present the way that you think. I pray that you'll be able to look ahead and as you go forth from this place to see in the face of other people the possibility that God might be present here for you, to see in the love that somebody else shows you the possibility that God is in that moment for you, to see in the wisdom, to see in the little steps of growth, to see in the change, to see the good in the world around you that God is present for you. And once you're able to see that, you're going to need to revise your expectations. Because friend, once you realize that God is here and that he's here for you, everything will be different. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that where you are, everything is different. But that means that we're going to have to let go of those ideas and understandings that, that we hold on to that, that aren't true, that aren't the proper understanding of who you are, that they aren't the proper understanding of your will, Lord. We know that by your power, you can help us to set those things down and instead to learn to see you clearly. Where you are, Lord, you do bring into being a kind of justice and a kind of righteousness. But you do it through the gifts that only you have ever given. Through mercy, through forgiveness, through love, by the power of your Holy Spirit working within each of us. So awaken us to your presence, Lord, and revise our understandings and our expectations so that we will see you at work, for you are working here among us. Grant us these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.